one. All right, we're recording and we're live with Aaron. How are you, Aaron? I'm good. What about you? You're good. I'm I'm well. I'm well. It's been uh, what few months? I guess since we last. No, it's been more than a few months. Uh, I think in March, right? We last spoke. How yeah, was... I think March or April or something like that. I was doing my uh, sort of um, Corona themes podcast for a little while, where we yeah. didn't really speak about Corona. Corona. At all. I, I remember. <laughs> I remember. But are you still going with the the podcast thing? Or no, I no, I quit. We got back to work at uh, Bitcoin Magazine. Nice. We were taking nice. a break around that time. And um, I know it was also, I think the first couple of weeks that was very interesting in Corona and also because there was a lot of, um, there was a lot of unclarity and at some point sort of all opinions kind of became entrenched and everyone sort of understood what was going on. Mm. And that's where I, I didn't feel like I was really adding any value or, you know, it was everyone had an opinion already and everyone sort of knew what they knew and knew what they thought the facts were and at that point i could have kept going but then bitcoin magazine started up and i figured all right well it was fun while it lasted yeah game on again okay i i I might still do sort of like a maybe a series two on some other topic that's not bitcoin with bitcoiners at some point i've been thinking about been thinking about that but um now it's just uh on hold yeah. Okay. Well, that's, uh, that's, that's fair. You know, sometimes, uh, yeah, sometimes, you know, things come and go. Uh, I was going to say, as I was mentioning before we, we connected. That, I, I, that... I do uh, do a couple of other podcasts, by the way. I cool. do. Uh, which one? I start, I started the uh, fan William Shush NATO since then, okay, which okay. is, which is with uh, Shush Provost, who's a Bitcoin core contributor. And yes. we discuss very technical stuff. Mm. And then I have a Dutch podcast, which I've been doing for, over a year now, uh, which is called the Bitcoin Show. So cool. yeah, I'm I'm already doing two other podcasts. So the third one, I don't know I dropped that one. Gotcha, gotcha. Well, no, I was just gonna say is is that uh, I mean I'd been toying with the idea and it uploaded some stuff and all that, but uh, but yeah, the 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 one I'd done with you was was one of the 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 things that kind of got me to go. I'm doing this. Like I got I got nice. I got to just try. And it's so weird because I kind of don't know why i'm doing it or what like I, to what end or anything but i don't know at least right now it feels feels fun and uh and i'm enjoying it and uh yeah so i'm gonna keep going with it so we'll see where it goes like i said i'm on episode hey, 40 something hey let's be honest podcasts at this point are just an excuse for guys to call each other and have a good conversation there you go. There because you we go. know that we don't <laughs> normally do that. So this is our excuse now. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. There you go. Okay. So speaking of which, I was going to say is where, because as I was mentioning before, right? So I think a lot of us, uh, you know, uh, Bitcoin was a bit of a monumental kind of paradigm shift when, when it entered into our lives. But, but well before that, I'm curious to know what does your kind of story, your backstory before you got into Bitcoin look like? There's a before Bitcoin. <laughs> oh, I gotta... okay let's wrap that one up that's all <laughs> folks uh we're back tomorrow no i'm kidding i'm kidding. i continue <laughs> i gotta dig dig deep into my memory for that one no well okay so i uh i was always writing that was always sort of a thing even as a kid i was writing um more like stories but i was like engaging in uh contests and writing you know kid stories i guess but writing was always there i my mother still has sort of a newspaper snippet where i I won some sort of contest i think where i said i wanted to be a writer later so so i was always sort of writing and then when it got time to study something i ended up going to uh, I, i ended up studying journalism so i went to i don't know what the English word for the it's like a university but it's not the highest level type of university but I think in English it would still be called a university in 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 the Netherlands we sort of have different levels and journalism is anyways it doesn't matter that's a irrelevant detail I went on to study journalism I guess this was when I was about 20 or something so at that point I guess I at least sort of knew that I want to be a journalism uh, journalist and it always works out for me pretty well. I um, I thought it was interesting. I think I still think journalism has gotten a bad rep over 
especially you definitely see that in sort of the Bitcoin community and the sort of uh, alternative internet communities so where everyone hates all journalists all the time and they're all frauds and um, I think journalists are actually doing an important job or they could be doing an important job I, I, I question, I, I, for you writing though uh, sorry I interrupted something you're gonna say something go ahead no, go on with your question. No, I was, I was say, just going to say, say, in a, yeah. In, yeah. in a democracy, it does matter that people have an idea of what's going on and what's true and not, because you know mm. you got to figure out that sort of stuff somehow. And if all we have are sort of... Uh, how do I say this? If everyone only goes and looks... Finds their own news, finds their own truth, that's... I'm not sure that's the way it should work. There should be some, anyways, I'm going off a tangent now. I, I think there should be some balance where, yeah, journalism isn't always perfect. Journalists aren't always right. Um, but sort of the internet community isn't always right either. And there should be some sort of balance there, I think. Mm-hmm. But uh, th- I guess that was a bit of a distraction from the actual question. Hey, it's it's all good <laughs> in the hood, man. So I know, I, I but I'm very fascinated because uh, about just just in in general, like just writing, right? Uh, I, I studied electrical engineering, but I would say one of my favorite classes was probably my like uh, the like the one in class I had on English, um, just because like when I think back to like applic like applicable skills that I picked up in university. I don't think anything tops um, that one class, right? In the sense that I use that every day, all the time I'm speaking, I'm like writing proposals and this and that and every second of the day. So, um, but I'm curious, uh, was it like a family thing? Were you like coming from a family of writers or were you just like, I don't know, like did you uh, tell some stories when you were a kid and get some attention from some some girl or something? Or I don't know, like how, how did that, how did you fall down that rabbit hole? I'm curious. Or did you just gravitate towards I, it? Yeah, the latter, I think. I don't think I have a good story for you there. My my de- my father definitely wasn't a writer. My mother, neither. So uh, no one in the family, I think, as far as I know. No, that was just something that I found interesting for some reason. And when was your for first like early examples of writing for others? Like not just journaling or for some project or whatever, but like where you actually wrote something. Do you remember What kind of writing are you referring to? I don't know, for a school newspaper or um, I don't know, like for, for a city newspaper, I don't know, like in terms of journalism, like was, or was, was education your first like entrance into that? Um, Cause I never got into a fight before I took martial arts. <laughs> yeah, I don't remember, right? Oh yeah, I remember writing something for, uh, interesting question, this is the first time I'm sort of trying to think of that. I remember writing like, um, articles small articles for my football clubs magazine uh, i remember we had this game there was this thing where we took turns on writing like a report on the match we played this was when we were like 12 or something and we took turns in in writing this uh, these re- these match reports and i think the the time i had to write a report we lost like I don't know, five zero or something. Like it was not a good game, and then I I made a fantasy game out of it in, instead of like an actual match report. I wrote how we won with a I don't know seventy seven to zero and described all kinds of crazy goals and <laughs> that I I remember that now that you ask about it. <laughs> Um, okay, so I guess like, you know, uh, so you should go into journalism. I mean, what was that like? Uh, like our every class is on what, like writing? No, there, I mean, the history uh, of writing. I don't there, know. There's a bunch of classes on writing. These were probably my best classes, but there was also classes, just general classes, classes on history, classes on politics, classes on, um, you know, you have that sort of stuff as well. Um, what else? Yeah, there's a lot of... Also different types of journalism, like radio journalism, television journalism, like you're just doing all sorts of journalism stuff. But it's, it's, um, it, it wasn't a very in-depth study, I found. It was a very hands-on type of study where you learn how to sort of do a lot of stuff, but I didn't feel like you really got into the theory. Well, 
a bit maybe, but it wasn't really in depth. And I'm saying that because after I studied journalism, I went on to do a, get a master's degree at what I would say, what people in the Netherlands would say was an actual university, which is the University of Utrecht. That's where I did a master's in politics and society and historical perspective. Mm. So that's focused on basically how have humans organized over the centuries or over the millennia even, um, you know, different political systems, different economic systems, different ways of doing things and sort of making comparative studies between them and these kinds of things. And the thing I started to focus on personally was because you can sort of, especially when you get to the point where it's a master, uh, you, you sort of get to find your own topic. And then each class you get in, you can sort of, you, you got to write stuff, you got to write an essay or something, and then you can sort of pick a topic. So I started to drift towards a sp specific topic. And the topic I drifted towards was um, uh, stuff like uh, freedom of the press uh, or just the printing press itself or freedom of speech, uh, sort of these kinds of, that sort of general area of thing, of, of topics is where I personally found interest in. Because the reason was because, um, well, first of all, I was a journalist and I knew, or, you know, I studied journalism and that was part of my interest is, um, you know, press freedom and these kinds of things and how does that affect society? And that, that's something I found interesting, but also the emergence of the internet. Well, you know, the internet was becoming a big deal. And I figured that to better understand sort of the implications of something like the internet, how's the internet going to change society? How's the internet going to change the world? Well, if you want to understand that better, then maybe it helps to sort of study historical precedents of these kinds of new technologies that, that come about. So that's why I sort of studied, I started to drift towards the printing press as sort of the historical analogy of, you know, what, what if free information becomes more free? How does that change? What year was that, that the printing press was invented? Because that is like largely considered as like one of the, you know, big turning points for mankind. Is it like the 1800s or something? No, it was much earlier um, that it was invented. Well, so I should know this because I've <laughs> studied it. So, but I, I'm not sure if I'm going to be Anyways, able to whatever it is, it's I, a long well, time I, ago. <laughs> I think it was like 15, 1500s. Okay, okay. But then in, in China, they actually had a printing press, maybe like in the 800s or something like that. Hmm. Um, but uh, it was also banned for, especially like in Europe, it was, like it was invented, but then it was banned later on or only churches could have one or these kinds of things happened and this is gonna say, sound like a dumb question but a printing press I, so I, I i did i was in robotics for eight years i i but i'm just curious what is, is it like a robotic kind of system that is it like a printer essentially or like what what i'm just curious like how does it uh what was that innovation because like they had pens before that right was it just some yeah one who figured out how to make the pen do what you wanted to do autonomously or something i don't even know no, I think the first printing press, you had like slots and you could put letters in the slots and, then, uh, you know, you put a bunch of letters so they form words and sentences and they form a whole page eventually. And then basically it works like a stamp a little bit, I guess. So you're basically stamping pages of text instead of having to rewrite all of the text. I, I I think that was sort yeah, of like the a first. typewriter, like old school, but more like, I guess, like, uh, anyways, uh, anyways, that's, that's the vision that came to my mind. Like, remember typewriters, they'd be like, tick, 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 but like, I guess more like a stamp type of deal, right? Yeah, it, I think that's how it works. I, I didn't study the technical but it was, part it was of it extensively, but it was essentially humanity's first way of being able to like create memes or like create ideas that 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 can travel right widely is that was that was that I mean, why it's, it was so important i mean humans could write before then mm. but that was a very slow process and there wasn't very much that was written so uh, that also meant that most of the population was illiterate because you know there was a really good reason to learn to write in the first place mm. And that's in turn meant, for example, that the, the Bible, which obviously was sort of the most important thing, uh, that was 
that could only be read by a very small number of people that controlled yeah, that were mm. for the Catholic Church for the church. I guess different churches in different parts of the world, but that's not really the point. So you know the the thing that that people cared about, like the the, the main thing in their life was God and the church. And then the interpretation of the word of God was left to a small group of people. So they were basically controlling entire society. Mm. Uh, with the advent of the printing press, that's one of the main things that changed is that the Bible could be printed. So there were now way more Bibles. It was much faster to distribute the Bible. And therefore, um, people became literate because they wanted to read the Bible. And once they could read the Bible, they could now interpret it the word of God for themselves without needing to rely on a trusted third party, so to say. So that was there, like, would you say one of the main like drivers for people wanting to learn to, to become literate initially? Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Like, I read the say, Bible. That's, that's, that's cool. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and, and, well, that, and that, and that really um, ultimately undermined the power of the church because now a whole, hmm. group, a whole bunch of people start speaking, you know, these things that these these people have been telling us i don't i'm not seeing that in the bible anywhere they've been lying to us and they started to interpret it in themselves and interesting that's how interesting. that's how protestantism began and that's so, how how the world changed so yes yeah, so your master's uh degree was on this or i mean your thesis rather or you you wrote uh like no, you focused this, on or this was, was this? this was more of a minor essay i think a minor essay okay, okay 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 no my master's thesis was well i i wrote a I guess a major essay, which is also maybe, so that was sort of the minor essay I just mentioned, I think, if it even was an essay, I don't know. Um, an interesting, another interesting example is how the printing press was distributed differently between the North American colonies and the South American colonies, you know, back when they were colonies, hmm. where, where the South American colonies were, the printing press was uh, controlled much stricter uh, by the, the, the Spanish crown essentially mm. while in the North American colonies the printing press was more widely distributed within like a village could have a printing press or these kinds of things so therefore what was true what was knowledge what was people what the the, the realm of stuff people could discuss was very controlled in South America while in North America people could discuss politics for example so you had uh, at some point you had the federalist papers which you might have heard of and people started to discuss the idea of british philosophers uh, john locke and this guy and ultimately the founding fathers just started to spread their ideas they were using the printing press for this and you know this is how how north america i think became a very democratic um part of the world while south america still struggling and definitely took a lot longer to sort of gain some level of democracy there so it's interesting that these kinds of things even though this was like hundreds of years ago ago it, it still echoes to today okay interesting wait hold on you said the wait, when when was the united states founded approximately i think it was 1718 wait 1776 right is that right? Interesting. So that been so so that means that the that the printing press had been around for almost you know two hundred years by then maybe, and uh, and they 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 essentially leveraged this technology along with what other technology probably like guns as well <laughs> that helped a little bit yeah, yeah. <laughs> maybe a Mus bit of germs. <laughs> Mus well, muskets for sure. Uh, George mm. Orwell wrote a wrote an essay essay on this, which is called "You and the Atom Bomb." where he hmm. describes the history of mankind through this perspective of uh, weaponry and how the technology of weaponry develops. And one of the things from that essay, uh, that, that essay, by the way, was sort of the basis for the book 1984. But uh, I, I digress. One of, the argue, uh, one of the arguments he made is that uh, it, the musket, indeed, was one of the democrati democratizing forces in uh, in north america for example yeah but that, or, that, or that, e even in france and just around that's a the world bit, that's a bit counterintuitive isn't it like most people think like oh guns but like 
isn't it funny how guns actually led to more freedom or i guess like a, yeah well not the, guns the, but like the diversification or like the wide usage of them or rather <laughs> yeah well that's the argument the argument is that different types of technology are more or less democratic uh, based on how many people can sort of have one or control it so the musket is very decentralized a lot of people can have one and once when the musket was sort of the best weapon in the world that means you have a very distributed decentralized type of society where everyone can can fight for themselves uh, when or or organize or these kinds of things while in a world where the cannon was the main weapon that means you had a very centralized society because these Crazy. were like big things with big cannons. And then the essay ultimately is about the atom bomb and how that it once again is a very centralized weapon. So he foresees a much more centralized world with centralized uh, power. Where, you know, in, in 1984, he describes this as Oceania and what, whatever the free are. To, we were always at war with Oceania. You know that, right? So what happens after, I guess, you know, uh, university or as you'd say, as you said, you know, proper university or something like that, right? So what, what do you do after that? I mean, how do you, yeah, like, where do you apply all this, like, kind of historical knowledge, this ability to kind of connect with other humans, you know, at a very important level uh, using words? Wait, hold on. So was this all in English then? Like, because you said you're in the Netherlands, right? Or where are you in right now? I, yeah, I'm in the Netherlands. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. This was all in the Netherlands. Mm, and it's all English? I've it, the university was sort of 50 50 some classes in dutch some in english mm, mm. so yeah. yeah what do you do after that then uh <laughs> so i was doing some internships um i like you said i wanted to sort of apply my i i wanted to apply this kind of knowledge into you know being a journalist that's what i wanted but i was doing an internship at if there are Dutch people listening, it was happy to tight. Uh, if you're not Dutch, you're not going to know it. But it's a, it's a fairly well-known opinion magazine, I guess. I would say it was term for that. Well, not not quite news, but like a monthly magazine with um, background sort of stuff. And uh, I was doing an internship there and I was coming in hopeful that I could write sort of interesting in-depth stories about stuff that's going on around the world. But um, it turned out that the way they saw it was more like a typical internship where, you know, I was writing sort of the small parts in the back of the magazine or some web stuff, which was mostly inf intended to be filler or just nothing, nothing that sort of interested me uh, or, you know, getting coffee or just intern stuff is what I ended up doing so, editing someone else, look, looking for typos in someone else's article, just that sort of stuff. But I wanted to do more. I wanted to, you know, I wanted to prove myself. I wanted to show them that I could actually write an interesting article if I got the chance. Now, the way it works in journalism, of course, definitely, um, yeah, is that it's not like someone, well, that could happen as well. Ideally, you come up with your own stories. You pitch your story to like the lead editor or whoever you say, I got. I found something really interesting, and I wanted to write a story about it. So I was on the lookout for interesting stuff that hadn't been covered a lot yet. That was what I was looking for to write, like a cool story. And then at some point, my roommates were ordering cheap cigarettes online from Moldavia for like <laughs> three three euros a package or something. And they were doing that on a website called the Silk Road. <laughs> and and I had no idea what that was, but you know, sounded interesting to me, sort of. So I was curious how that worked. And I started to ask a couple of questions. And they told me they were using this different type of the this special kind of internet money. And that sounded interesting as well. So I started to look into that a little bit with uh, in the back of my mind, this idea that, you know, maybe. Maybe there's a story here. Who knows? Sounds interesting. People are buying. At that point, I knew people were also buying drugs online. So that's, you know, now, now it's starting to sound like an interesting story. People are buying drugs online and having it ordered to their home with a special type of internet money. This sounds like an interesting story. So I started to follow it a bit, research a bit. Uh, this was like late 2012, I think. Um, and I, 
I I remember I I subscribed. I was a redditor. I you know I was spending wasting time on Reddit pretty often uh, in my in my down hours, and I um, subscribed to. I found a Bitcoin Reddit, so I subscribed, and I started to look. You know, take keep an eye on this this project for a little while. What, what year are we and in now? Twenty something. This was yeah late twenty twelve. Twenty twelve. Okay. 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 Yeah. Uh, or maybe. No, it was early 2013, actually, I think. Yeah, it was uh, like January, February 2013. Okay, so you're on the Bitcoin time. Reddit, all right? And then what happens? <laughs> yeah, so I start noticing that people are actually celebrating that the price is going up. So I, you know, I didn't even realize that the price, that there was a fluctuating price. I was thinking of it like PayPal, but anonymous. That was my mindset. And then apparently the price is fluctuating. That's interesting what's going on here. And then what was even more interesting was that I was seeing some um, some people speak about, talk about this thing, like they had an idea about like changing the world or improving the world or making a difference in the world. And that really was something I, that now I got really interested. Like this isn't just a project to buy drugs. This isn't just something that's convenient. This is not something that, that people just use because it's anonymous this is like a movement. It's like a movement of people that want to accomplish something. Mm -hmm. And that was really interesting. So then now I got truly interested and now I started to research this Bitcoin project. And I remember, um, so at this point, just to give a little bit more context, I, I was already, I was working as a journalist a little bit and I was doing some freelance stuff, but I hadn't really found one particular project I was super interested in. It was all a little bit random. I was doing some interviews with some people or some movie reviews or the small stuff on the internet internship. It was all sort of random, but I had topics that I were sort of considering that could be interesting as something I could specialize in. And the big one was finance, the economy, economics after the whole uh, 2008 crisis and the bailouts and all of that. I, you know, that, sparked my interest and i sort of figured there's probably not enough journalists actually looking at this stuff that understand what's going on in these finance in these uh in these wall street buildings and people everyone's looking at what's going on in washington dc everyone's looking at what's going on in you know den haag here in the netherlands or in brussels maybe but no one's actually looking what's going on in frankfurt or in on Wall Street, or like, well, where are all the finance journalists? Why didn't anyone see this coming? So that was sort of on my mind as something that I found interesting. Another thing that I found interesting was, um, like I mentioned, the advent of the internet and these kinds of things is why I focused on these things during my university. And in particular, I, uh, I developed an interest for, I, I thought the free and open source movement was a very interesting concepts that, you know, people are actually apparently breaking the rules of economics and providing something for free for everyone to use and you know th this seems to be succeeding at some scale how big could this become that's that's interesting um and then i found about bitcoin and then i started to realize that bitcoin was actually a type of money and it was a merger of these two topics i found quite interesting it was a free and open source type of money that was there to change how money and how finance and how economics worked so that now i got really interested and uh, i did my research and at some point i found i found the genesis block and i found satoshi's quote in the genesis block where he said you know the the times january 3rd chancellor is on the brink of second bailout for banks whatever the exact tagline was and and then that really blew my mind like okay this isn't this is literally the, the whole idea <laughs> this is the movement this was this is actually the plan this is actually something people want to do now i want to <laughs> sign me up <laughs> yeah well that well this so this is early 2013 and then what then what happened then is i was doing my research i was learning about this i was thinking about this i was getting kind of excited about all of this i was figuring out in my mind could this actually work or not or and then um this uh this big april bubble happens around that time so in you know the price went from whatever maybe ten dollars in january to like 260 in uh, april so it was like a big run-up and around that time in the netherlands mainstream media started to pay attention now 
all of a sudden this project that I had discovered that I found super interesting that I wanted to write an article about potentially for during my internship. Now, all of a sudden I was being scooped basically by all of these other media, you know, which kind of sucks because, oh, now everyone's writing about it. I thought I had found something interesting, you know, but what all these other media were doing was I was reading it and I, I, they were seeing something completely different than I was seeing. I was seeing a, a super interesting technology, mm. a movement of people that want to change things. I thought it was viable. I think it could work. Like I'm, this is, you know, it could replace. Everyone's mad at banks. Like this is an alternative. Everyone's. And, and the only thing I was reading in the media was criminals, Ponzi scheme, hype, digital bubble. You know, it was all so negative, and I. I couldn't understand why they weren't seeing what I was seeing. I was seeing something super interesting. So that's when I figured, okay, well, I guess I'm going to, my internship was ending around this point. I didn't write an article on Bitcoin for my uh, internet ship, internship, but I figured, okay, well, at least I can write articles for myself, I guess. And the idea was a little bit in spirit of sort of the open source free software kind of thinking was I'll write the articles and then I'll um, publish them sort of on an open license. Like anyone can republish this article if you want. I don't want anything back. Just feel free to republish it on your own website or your blog or wherever you want. Go ahead. So I wrote a series of articles where I was essentially dismissing or re um, what's a better word, debunking the stuff I was reading in the media. So I was explaining why Bitcoin is in the Ponzi scheme. I was explaining why it's not just good for criminals. I was explaining why, I don't know, why um, the, an article on the unequal distribution of uh, Bitcoin for where some people have a lot and you know newcomers would have to. And I wrote why I don't think that's unfair at all. And I, I wrote like a five or six or maybe seven of these kinds of articles. And I published them on my own blog with sort of this open license, like go ahead. And then it was indeed republished and it was like republished on some sort of on, on the Dutch Gold's blog for, you know, for gold bugs. And it was republished on the Pirate Party in the Netherlands, republished on their blog. And there were a couple of others. It was republished here and there. And um, it got, uh, so that got some traction. It was invited on some podcasts, Dutch podcasts and these, these kind of things. And then by late 2013, there was another price boom, right? It went to like 1100 or something and at that point i figured okay see i i was right this wasn't a ponzi scheme I, you know and and this this could be big i'm gonna i'm gonna start a, a new site so i started a new site in dutch with a friend called coin current and we just started to cover the news the news about bitcoin like two or three articles a day whatever it was uh, and around that time uh, i also want to write more in-depth articles so I was doing really newsy stuff but I figured eh, I could do some more thought out sort of in-depth kind of articles and I started to reach out to Bitcoin Magazine for example and also Coindesk uh, to see if they were interested. I became like a Dutch correspondent for Coindesk for a while where I sort of helped them with Dutch news and then for Bitcoin Magazine I wrote a bunch of articles as well so that's how I I, I totally forgot what your question was, but that's how I sort of hey, rolled uh, into I, Bitcoin. I don't even know. But yeah, uh, Bitcoin journalism. Uh, so yeah, all I care is that it's interesting. Hey, but I was going to ask you, how, so over your, like, the arc of that this career now, whatever, seven, eight years, how many articles would you say you've written now, approximately? Do you have any clue or? I don't know. Uh, like 10, 100,000, 10,000? Like, what order of magnitude are we talking here? Probably like 100. Yeah. So, and well, no, it's got to be more probably, right? Um, I don't know, maybe 200. I don't know. I, I'd have to sort of, I used to write way more for a while. I, there, was a while there was a period where I wrote like three articles a day. While now at Bitcoin Magazine, I take more time per article. And so that, there's a big difference in sort of how many articles. Also in, in my, on my Dutch news site, I wrote like, Definitely a, two a day at least. So I don't know. If, so, so, okay, so what happens Probably now? a lot more than 100. So, so, so what happens now? So now you're like, okay, this thing is super cool. Uh, okay, now everyone else is writing about it. I missed the boat. Wait, maybe I didn't because 
I, I see some sort of like asymmetrical like thing going on here where like I see the world in a certain way and, and others don't. Okay, so now you start writing about it, uh, pick up what a bit of steam on Reddit, I assume, like as well, or, or were people starting to find you globally or was it? More oh, no, no, this was uh, Dutch only at first. Only it was Dutch. just, okay. yeah, so definitely not globally. And then what, around 2014 or something, you said you started in uh, becoming Bitcoin Magazine's correspondent? I became a uh, Coindesk's, Coindesk's. Uh, correspondent for the Netherlands. For Interesting. A, or, uh, maybe not. I don't know if that was like my official title. Probably yeah, not. Yeah, but yeah. that was what I started doing for a while. Uh, and then uh, also write for Bitcoin Magazine. I should know that something I haven't mentioned, which is maybe interesting to mm. mention, is that j just before I heard about Bitcoin, I think it must have been like 2012, probably. I think, yeah, I, I, read, um, I read the Black Swan. So, uh, Nassim Taleb's Black Swan. So that that probably helps me sort of recognize that, okay, this is something we need to pay attention to because it could be a Black Swan. And um, mm. I, I still, I think that was probably right. Hmm. Interesting. And well, he even said so to some extent, right? I think he's a Bitcoin uh, advocate or something. I've seen him see, say positive things about it. Yeah. yeah. Um, interesting. Okay. So then, uh, and then, and then what? So now you're writing, I guess, is it mostly like independently for these two companies? And you're still, are you still writing on your own as well? Or mostly through these two publications or through these websites? Because they are kind of like, I guess, they're the only two that I really think about, you know, what I think about, um, like thoughtful, kind of insightful, uh, you know, journalism in this space. Uh, well, there was also Cointelegraph. So mm. I, I, I mean, there's a whole bunch of them, of course, but I'm meaning like back then, mm. I think back in these days, there were probably like free, I would say. Yeah, free yeah, sort yeah. Of Cointelegraph free. as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, there might be, might have been even smaller ones, but I think sort of the main free for a while were Coindesk, Bitcoin Magazine, Cointelegraph. Mm. Uh, and I and I started to write for Coin Telegraph as well a little bit later, I think. And I was also doing my own thing, Coin Courant, the Dutch uh, news site. Uh, I did the Dutch one for about a year, and then I figured that it wasn't really um, gonna make me enough money to keep going. So I, I started to just go freelance for these other these English publications. And uh, and curious, what does what does that journey look like? Like, were there any milestones or landmark kind of I don't know experiences or articles or things that you kind of remember when you think back to those early days? Um, yeah, like articles that I don't know are still kind of eternal. I mean, I think so. Time timeline wise, we're like late 2014 now, I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and I think I still had. Um, I still had a job on the side as well, just a non-journalism job, just something to pay the rent. Mm. And and it was around that time where I was getting some work from from Coin Telegraph, some more, and and it got to the point where I figured, okay, I'm just gonna do this full time. I'm just gonna focus on this. I, this is what I want to do. This is what I find interesting. Uh, being a freelance writer back then wasn't wasn't gonna make you rich. <laughs> In fact, it was not gonna make you rich at all. But I figured I can probably sustain myself and then I can focus on the thing that I find interesting all day, every day, uh, instead of having to do this other thing on the side, which is not interesting. So uh, that was kind of a big gamble in a way because, um, you know, being a freelancer and on, I was doing it on a shoestring budget. Uh, and then I decided to... Um, I also left the Netherlands at that point. I wanted to go somewhere where life would be cheaper to, a, to be able to actually do this. So I left and I ended up in Berlin. So And I, I lived in Berlin throughout 2015. And then for, during that year, so 2015, that's when the whole block size debate really kind of started. It was always lingering. It was always there in the background. It was always... You know, within the technical community, people were sort of noticing or, or arguing on forums and these kinds of places. And I knew about that and I thought it was interesting and I kept an eye on that. I was speaking with people about it. And then when it became sort of a thing on the foreground around May 2015 or something, that's when I kind of jumped on that because I knew what was going on. I knew what this debate was about. I knew how to sort of explain to people what was going on and provide context with that. And um, these articles were 
pretty popular i think so you've won you did very well it's also when um around the same time bitcoin magazine was bought by david bailey and the why bitcoin team they did why bitcoin before that they bought bitcoin magazine i started to write some of these articles for them and then a couple months later they uh, they hired me on the team so i've been with bitcoin magazine since then Yeah, I was going to say this to later, but it might be appropriate to bring this up now, which is this recent article, right, that you did with Pete Rizzo. Um, I apologize. I was, or was it not? Uh, you guys did an a, like another article or something on on that? Yeah, we, like a follow up or something. I don't know. Uh, what do you want to? What are you guys calling well, it? Well, well, it's more like a prequel, really. So a prequel, prequel. to like the block size, uh, nice. block size wars. Yeah, the, there was another debate before the block size thing started where some developers were already getting sort of into into a little bit of a fight over uh they, this was about the pay to sh upgrade so like every bitcoin address you see that starts with a free that's p2sh and that was a soft fork from 2012 and there was disagreement about that and that's sort of when the community the technical community first you know realized that they weren't always going to be able to get along about everything and the the bitcoin community in general the the developers the miners the broader community everyone's at that point for the first time sort of trying to figure out okay how do we actually upgrade this thing how do we actually change bitcoin now that satoshi is gone when satoshi was around he sort of had a natural authority he was the founder if he wants to deploy a change if he wants to deploy an upgrade then you know everyone would probably follow along unless maybe it would have been a horrible horrible upgrade but that never happened so back in satoshi's days he was just the leader of the project when satoshi left that left behind sort of a power vacuum in a way gavin and reason was sort of his um, successor but he didn't have the same level of natural authority because he wasn't the founder and even the succession itself wasn't really official or anything it just sort of happened gavin sort of became the de facto uh successor i i think i would say I, that's how he called himself so i think that's accurate I think that's a good way of putting it. Uh, and, and then so now there was this other proposal to upgrade the protocol and that wasn't, it wasn't obvious how that could be done. Who has, who has the authority to do this? And this is what this article is about, where this is ex explored for the first time and the debates back then. And this was, uh, this, this all took place in like a couple of months. And, um, in 2011 2012 so this is before my time as well and i think you, you could really see it as a sort of a precursor to the block size debate where the same type of debate happened on a much larger scale with a even stronger disagreement and um say same kind of contention and so yeah so it's, it's a prequel It's a prequel. Okay, so it's what happened prior to uh, to the block size debate. I, 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 th I think uh, Pete, I, I heard Pete describe it on a different podcast as uh, it's like the Hobbit to the Lord of the Rings. <laughs> love it, love it. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I, I, I don't think I've shared many comments publicly about the block size debate, but I, I definitely have some stories there. But anyway, so back to yours. Where, 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 uh, so where, where, so, okay, so that's interesting. So that was a very, I remember it very clearly. It was a very nuanced, a very difficult uh even people in the industry in this space is very interesting as to like kind of see all the power centers in in the uh, in the ecosystem and and uh and who's able to do what um i should have worn my uasf hat today uh anyways so so but That's what what hair. you do eh? sweet uh so what happens uh what happens after this so you so now they're like uh so you said uh you know you're working now for bitcoin magazine bailey buys it uh you guys are you said uh, around 20 when was it 15 16 did he uh so we met so i was writing for bitcoin magazine uh as a freelancer as a freelancer and, yeah and then we met uh at scaling bitcoin in montreal so this was september 2015 i met david i met a uh, tyler other people of the team other writers and I think it was right there in Montreal where he where he offered me a job where he asked me to get on board on on the in the Bitcoin magazine team as a full time employee. Awesome. Okay, and then uh, and then I guess 
I mean, the last seven years seem like a, a bit of a, a blur, um, you know, in terms of after you get into Bitcoin it all, it all every day feels like an eternity. And uh, but yet the entire thing also feels like it just took place in a day. Uh, it's kind of weird. But so what, what's uh, yeah, what does your journey look like? I guess once you're now like now you're, you know, you're working for like you're essentially the voice of Bitcoin to some extent, right? I mean, uh, even Coindesk, they don't have the word Bitcoin in their name. <laughs> I've always respected that a lot about, you know, Bitcoin Magazine, how they've been, you know, through all the noise, they've been able to kind of maintain that uh, that North Star, if you will. Must have been hard. <laughs> Did you guys get sucked that was, that was, into the whole, like everything, like all the sh everything that happened in between? Uh, a little bit. We 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 drifted a little bit. I think this was in um, two thousand and seventeen. I don't think I personally drifted much. I I always kept my eyes on the ball. But mm. as as Bitcoin Magazine, you know it. Uh, there was never really a, a a conscious choice. I think to cover different projects, but you know. It just sort of happens, um, you know. It only became clear later, I think, that you know the the communities today they're very very distinct communities. I think you have sort of the Bitcoin community, and you have sort of the blockchain people, and you have sort of the Ethereum people, and they mm -hmm. there's some interaction, but they're really different, you know, groups of people to a very large extent. Uh, and and you know there was a time where that wasn't the case yet. So that's also when, you know, some of the people in the Bitcoin community, to call it that, they started some sort of other project called Ethereum, or they started some, they they thought that you could have a, you know, blockchain without Bitcoin thing. And, you know, these were sort of people that were in the same group before. And then, so as a magazine, you, you at first we would, cover that as well like okay this guy's starting something new that that might be worth an article but then over time i think we we really it diluted a bit because there were so much more so many more non-bitcoin projects than bitcoin projects or so much more non-bitcoin news than non-bitcoin news uh, and i think at that point i uh i i met david again at a at another conference one of our own conferences and and um we sat down and i told david let's make Bitcoin magazine, the Bitcoin part of the company, because there was already, there were, there was distributed, there was this was conference that was distributed magazine. And I told David, let's make, like you said, uh, sorry, let's make Bitcoin magazine sort of the North star for Bitcoin. We need something like that in this industry, something that's Bitcoin focused and that's, that's there. And David immediately loved the idea. And like the next day he was making changes and, I was getting calls like we're changing it now. We're we're going for it. We're when Bitcoin was magazine. this? This was um 2017, I think, from the top of my. And what, was it what, when, what 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 threw you over the edge? Was it uh, like what was it? Was did something happen? Because there's been so many like you know wacky. Things oh, for for me personally, I was uh, I was working as a technical editor. I, I that's still my title, but uh, back in these days, I was actually doing that more actively. To, today, not so much, but that meant. I was also going over other people's articles and helping them out with the tech stuff or fact checking some tech stuff or like doing doing work on articles that weren't necessarily my own. And uh, I was getting a lot of these articles about, you know, some altcoin or some blockchain project or something. And then I had to do the technical part and you know it, it hard to it, sleep at night it really sucks <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the problem you know the problem with it is that okay someone claims to have invented or a, a proof of stake system that works i'm fairly sure that's not true i'm fairly sure that that cannot work i'm not 100 percent sure but i i have very serious doubts about that however the way they are selling it the way they are describing it in their press releases and these kinds of things it's really they're they're just obscuring the actual problems, and then once people figure out these problems, they're just obscuring it more. So just l layers of obscurity. That's really what these kind of projects often are: obscurity on top of obscurity on top of obscurity. So now I have to go in as a technical editor, and I have to, for example, fact check this or find out why it does work or doesn't work. 
and it felt like I was doing, I was, my job was to sit in at magic shows and find out why it's not really magic. You know, we know it's not really magic. We know it's a trick, but still figuring it out can be hard and time intensive and, you know, it's not fun. So that was my job at some point where I just had to figure out, okay, why isn't this magic? And I, I felt like this, this is not what we should be doing. This is a waste of my time. It's a waste of everyone's time. I feel, you know, let's Bitcoin magazine. It should be Bitcoin magazine. Let's, let's focus on the most important thing that's going on in this, in this industry. Probably one of the most important things that's going on in the world, or at least possibly like if, if Bitcoin succeeds, then that's a big deal. It's, you know, it's a, as big of a deal as the internet i'm not saying it will succeed that's kind of an open question still but i think it could be a big deal and that alone if you're a bitcoin magazine let's let's focus on that let's see if it's going to succeed or not or see what the problems are see just even just news let's see what kind of new bitcoin startup is happening that's that's more interesting to me than blockchain project number 47 that that has found some sort of uh Aaron curious so uh to just to you know to speak about the elephant in the room right uh from what I know I think Vitalik used to write for Bitcoin magazine at one point right, right. and it was you know I mean, and he's from Toronto so I mean I have no hard feelings by the way I'm a big fan of free market ideas blah 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 I love it um but I think you know we're all here to like battle out ideas so that's that's it's good to talk about these things um but just curious what are your thoughts on you know, what were your thoughts rather early on, I guess, with the white paper um, that Vitalik was putting on? Were you at the time like, oh, my God, like this is, you know, maybe the future or were you like skeptical, less skeptical and then skeptical again? Or like kind of where, where, where where's your uh, how's your, you know, kind of like a moral sensor or compass on on this project? Um, curious. Uh, I basically always thought I, I I figured out for myself at least that I think one of the valuable things about Bitcoin or maybe the valuable thing or the thing that matters is digital scarcity. Is this twenty one million limits? And if someone something would ever overtake Bitcoin, that would undermine this whole idea of digital scarcity. Then you know. And, and, because if something overtakes Bitcoin, then what's to say that the next project won't overtake that project and so forth. And then what is limited supply even, what does it even mean? It's, it just loses its important thing. It just loses its value. So I thought altcoins are always a bad idea just for that reason. If you want to do something more with Bitcoin, then you're going to have to either change Bitcoin or build something on top of Bitcoin. That was, I always felt that way. So when the Ethereum thing came around, uh, the other thing I didn't like about Ethereum at all was the, the pre-mine and the pre-sale and however they want to call it. I didn't like that at all. I have one of the things I love about Bitcoin is that it has this fair launch that no one, even Satoshi himself, didn't have some sort of unfair advantage. He put out the white paper months before he put out the code. When he put out the code, he, you know, every, everyone was free to mine. Everyone had months to learn about the project. I. All of that, I love that. I think that's so important. And Ethereum, in my eyes, didn't have all any of that. So it was just a commercial project. And there's nothing necessarily morally wrong with that. It's just something I personally didn't find interesting in the, in the same way that I found Bitcoin interesting. And my idea was always that, you know, if they produce something valuable, cool. I'll, I'll use something valuable. You know, for example... You know, I, I like to play online poker and that's all being restricted and 10 years ago was even worse. And, you know, I figured if they can figure out some sort of a poker game on Ethereum, hey, that would be cool. I'll use that. But I'm not going to be involved with the project. I'm not going to like invest in it or write about I just don't think it's interesting in that in that way. So, you know, if, go ahead and build it and then I'll use it if it's interesting ever, maybe, perhaps. But But that's as far as my interest just went. Since then, they've lost my interest even more with, um, you know, the. it just strikes me as a very centralized and therefore uninteresting project. It's centralized around the Ethereum Foundation um, who will reverse contracts if they don't like the outcome and who will just change the protocol whenever they feel like. I'm not saying it's necessarily ethically wrong. There's nothing morally wrong. Although, you know, 
maybe false advertising you could say is morally wrong advertising it as this platform that will be like the next internet and the next facebook and everything will happen on ethereum that's they've, they've been overselling it i think which is morally wrong but other than that i don't have a strong hatred against it i think i just think it's mostly centralized and therefore not very interesting Oh, you're uh, sorry, man. Sorry, decentralized. Uh, you said it's the fact the fact that it doesn't. It's not deflationary. I think the actual words uh, Vitalik at least used when I asked him back in whenever it was was disinflationary. So it's not inflationary, not deflationary. Yeah, but it's not it's just about that inflationary. So so there's that. I'm just saying is like trying to sum up like the key points. So there's like the lack of cent- lack of decentralization, the lack of adherence or like I guess towards like you know a, de- a deflationary kind of you know limited and also the fact well, the, that just 21... introducing a new currency in itself is inflating the 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 core. Yeah, um, that's it. And then the yeah, so there were there were all these kind of points uh, oh and the pre-sale was another important one right um and i actually agree with all of you i I agree with all of those uh with you on that um but let's talk about what this the 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 sale was which is which is not the sale but the, the 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 offering was world computer or like a turing complete you know programmable blockchain if you will right um do you think they delivered on that uh, in terms of that that vision, and is that a noble cause? And uh, or you know, or do you think that you know? Are, are you? I guess what eventually my question is getting to like, do you think there's a place for this on top of Bitcoin? Um, are projects like RSK interesting? And and it does programmability and because like look, Twitter is centralized and everything is centralized and. So, I mean, someone could argue that maybe, you know, we shouldn't have like middlemen, even in like the way tweets are done and our journalism. And so I'm curious, like, so it's kind of a lot, lot of questions in there, but I'll stop there. But yeah. I mean, I guess the main problem is scalability, right? If you want to do something on a decentralized protocol, that's, that's going to be a challenge uh, scale wise, but you know, I'm, I'm open with, also, I think if something of value is really built on something like Ethereum, I think this is a argument Paul Storch made years ago, hmm. that one use case will end up being more valuable than other use cases. And therefore, that one thing will just crowd out all of the others. And therefore, it won't really be a multi-use case thing. It won't really be a world computer. It will just be a token computer or it will just be whatever like that could be the one it will just be a one thing what one one purpose thing in the end so the pitch of you know enabling all of these different things is just gonna be you know not gonna play out because one thing is gonna crowd out all of the others but i'm in general i'm open to experimentation um i'm open to be proven wrong as well if they produce something valuable i'm you know, I would use it. Sure. Are you interested in Uniswap? And- Do you find that cool? I mean, like, I mean, like, I get. Don't get me wrong. Like, I'm, I'm one of Ethereum's biggest critics. Have been forever. But decentralizing a centralized exchange, um, well, it's I, only that can be a bit of a noble cause, no? Like, in terms of like, you know, we've seen all the problems with centralization of that. Uh, yeah. So, so curious. Like, just I mean, let's get past the ICO and all that BS. But I'm saying let let's. You know, so is there innovation in there? Is, is I guess my fundamental question from your view. I haven't looked at Uniswap at in detail, but you can do decentralized exchanges on Bitcoin or on Lightning. That's that's definitely possible. So I'm not sure if it adds value. Maybe it does. I haven't looked at it in detail, but I I do think that the most what we really need is a decentralized exchange that supports fiat. That's that's the important thing we really need, and that's uh, I don't think Uniswap is that right. That's that's maybe something like BISC. Yeah, yeah. Have you heard of Wazirx? Mm, Binance I don't think recently so. acquired. So it's a really interesting story. But in the face of the bank ban in India, when the ban, when their RBI banned Bitcoin, centralized Bitcoin exchanges like ours, um, you know, we took them to court and and fought this thing out in court, and you know, eventually won, but during that period we obviously couldn't uh couldn't do what we needed to do um to service our customers we came up with the atm idea which i shared with you i think in our last podcast that didn't work out um 
but there was this one company and I interviewed Nischel recently as well, uh, the founder of a company called Wazirex. Um, they married, and I think this is like it's one of the most it's like clever things I've seen in the space. And I shouldn't be talking positively about my competitor, right? But I mean, you know, a good idea is a good idea. Um, uh, he came up with this beautiful idea. He said, okay, look, local Bitcoins is obviously going to solve this problem or whatever. These P2P exchanges are going to solve this problem for most people in India. But there's a big problem. If you have, um, you know, let's say you want to buy one Bitcoin. You have to make 30 decisions on local Bitcoins. You have to go buy the 0.2 and look through 50 ratings and you have to, okay, you bought your 0.2 and now you're going to buy the 0.1 and it is a mess. So he said, why do people like order book exchanges? Because they're super easy and the orders are right there. So this guy married the idea of an order book exchange with a P2P exchange and he took away the rating system, did KYC on his customers and uh, yeah, I mean, and, and I think kind of created this beautiful marriage, like I said, of like a centralized but, exchange with, yeah, but it's a P2P exchange. And so what they do is, let's say I want to buy and you want to sell, um, the Bitcoin that goes from your wallet, instead of coming straight to me, they escrow it, just like local Bitcoins, they escrow mm -hmm. the Bitcoin. And then I send you the money. And once you tell him, yes, I received the money, then he releases the Bitcoin, you know, to me. So that works with fiat as well. That works with fiat. That's why yeah, right. so bringing this up is, <clears throat> I think it's very, very fascinating, you know, and, uh, but yeah, but that, that's, you know, built on a normal database. Uh, they don't, they don't, I don't think they use any of uh, Ethereum for that. Anyways. Okay. So dude, uh, I know, I just realized how much time we've already uh, kind of gone through here. The contrarian, so anything else you want to share on the Bitcoin magazine front um, before we move on to kind of like the third, you know, American gladiator style questions here that I've got for you. Yeah, any, anything else on the Bitcoin magazine front, like whether it's a story or just any highlights or, um, you know, anything that people should be aware. I know you guys stream, streamed La BitConf recently. Uh, yeah. I know your well, article recently was super popular on, on Twitter land, but anything else that people should be maybe, I don't know, keeping an eye on? Uh, Bitcoin 2021 conference is coming up, hopefully if Corona Ooh. allows it and all of that. April, right, or something? Yeah, April. Right, right. Jack Dorsey the, is the is the main man, right? Mr. Yeah, Dorsey. yeah. Well, Jack Dorsey, Nick Zabo. Well, yeah, we got a good, bunch of good names. Amazing. Uh, the, amazing. The Bitcoin 2019 conference was was a lot of fun. So this one's going to be in LA. Nice weather. Should be good. Okay. Um, and then and then as I was asking you earlier about this contrarian question. So any. Um, oh wait, wait. Before we move off Bitcoin Magazine, Aaron, any uh, plans to make moves within India? With Bitcoin Magazine? <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's only well, like, reached, you know, a they, billion people there uh, and they all speak English or a lot of them do. <laughs> and people love Bitcoin there. Oh, we're online so they can read it, right? We don't need to translate or anything. That's a good point. Good point. But I guess what I was getting at is, is like more uh, like geographic specific things, like whether there's going to be like, are you guys going to take your conference there ever? Um, I don't know. Like, uh, anyways, whatever. If I, you can, guys... I, can, I can pitch the idea for you. Yeah, yeah. Well, for now, at least like I'd like Uno, to go. Unocoin's got quite a few users. You know, for now, we can maybe just uh, help promote, you know, Bitcoin Magazine through our newsletter and uh, through our Twitter feed and whatnot. Nice. And put a bit of more of a focus on on uh, you know what you guys have been doing. Um, yeah, but you're right. You're right. It's uh, it's online. So why why actually because back in the day, if you recall, Bitcoin Magazine was actually a magazine. <laughs> you remember? Or no. Yeah, yeah. There were like uh, 22 ed editions, I think, and we made another special edition when uh, for Bitcoin's 10 year anniversary. Cool, cool, cool. That was like uh, one and a half year ago. Cool. Or two uh, years ago. Yeah. Anyway. Um. So just to get to that, yeah, the contrarian question. So any any uh, beliefs that you hold to be true that you think most others in Bitcoin may disagree with you on? I think the the World Cup is probably the most important event in the world. The World Cup is the most important event. Okay, okay. okay. I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm mentioning that one because there's not a lot of overlap of Bitcoiners and football fans, I've noticed. Well, it happens every four years. I, I don't know yes, if that matters. I've, I've, <laughs> or don't I mean, there's a, there's, a, there's a lot of things where mm -hmm. I'm uh, I'm not really in line with sort of the crypto, crypto Twitter sphere, maybe. But I, I think a lot of people aren't, if I'm honest. Like if I ask, you know, if I ask people at meetups, what do you think of, taxes is that our taxes uh is it is it theft 
most people I meet kind of disagree with that. And, or if I ask about guns or, I don't know, there's a lot of topics where I think crypto Twitter is very ardent about it while uh, I, I'm not getting the impression that they're not. So that's why I mentioned football. I definitely don't meet a lot of Bitcoiners who like football. <laughs> <laughs> uh well yeah well i'm i'm, I'm from canada so we, we don't even call it football so i mean we, you're talking about soccer right i'm talking about football that's the one you play with a ball in your feet yeah i know but you know football is no. not that right <laughs> on this side of the I'm, world i'm i'm, <laughs> I'm not I, i'm not referring to hand deck <laughs> okay 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 uh okay so football i i, I can get with that is steak is that a thing you do you uh so yeah so that's another example so i tried the carnivore diet for um uh, last summer i tried it uh just to experiment i don't know just see what people are on about and i wanted to give it a go and uh, after i think it was day 10 where my uh I, I couldn't sleep. I, I started to wake up from dreams where I was being punched in the stomach, literally. I was just waking up like sweaty and like, whoa, someone just punched me in the stomach. And I realized, okay, this is my body telling me to eat vegetables. Cut the crap. Yeah, go and eat, <laughs> go and eat a carrot. <laughs> uh, okay, okay. Uh, okay, so uh, what else? I was going to say, yeah, so the I'm, I'm fairly, like, I'm fairly undecided about guns, by the way, because I just mentioned it. I'm fairly undecided about it. Less safe or anything. I think it's probably seems to be working out fairly well here, if you ask me. Yeah, but it does until it doesn't or something, right? I don't know. Hey, yeah. I'm going to ask you, the muscat, is that the one with that looks like a horn, like a saxophone or something? Is that the one with like the, is that the, do you know what a muscat looks like? I, I feel like it's like a hand shotgun or something. I, I, I could probably <laughs> recognize it. Okay, okay. I have no idea. I am. Yeah. I think, I, I think, I think thought, you're right. I, I actually, uh, when I was, uh, yeah, I, I actually had my first like proper gun experience last year, like at a, at a shooting range in Texas. It's pretty fun. Um, okay, so so okay, so that's that's okay. I'll take that. Um, AI, real quick. Any any thoughts on it? Uh, don't give a shit. Not really. Is it something that you uh, think about? Um, is that what we discussed last time on my podcast or not? I think we may, I think it may have come up. We were discussing a bunch of these kinds of things. Simulation I think theory you were came up. Asking me, right? Or no? Was I asking you? Yeah, I think simulation theory came up in AI. I think so. Uh, I think so. I'm, I'm pretty I'm pretty big on simulation theory. Do you think I we're think, living in a simulation? I mean, I think it's definitely it sounds plausible. Well, how do you disprove it though? Yeah. So, um, you, I think. Isn't it like one of those you, God you would questions? Have, you, you would have to sort of run a simulation yourself and then see if the same thing happens in the simulation you're running. And if something different sort of happens, then maybe you're not in a simulation yourself, right? But then there's probably some sort of game theoretical thing where you, what you need to do to make sure that it could actually be... I don't know. I'm okay, thinking aliens. out loud. <laughs> Dude, is there, is, are aliens real? <laughs> I don't know. I'm seeing stuff in Twitter. People are talking about aliens. Is that even a thing now? Like, should I be looking into this? Should I be Googling aliens? Well, did you see the monoliths appear everywhere? Yeah, but that was, wasn't that some dude just doing that or something? I thought they, no. uh, who knows? Uh, uh, oh. well, that was, that was also apparently some Israeli guy who said something about aliens. Uh, I, I, I haven't looked at it. Uh, I haven't researched it or anything, but I was some sort of Isra former official from israel who said that uh, there are in fact aliens and they've been in contact with uh, humans i know i mean you've probably heard of the fermi paradox no uh, i mean i've heard of that word but i don't think I. okay so the fermi it. the fermi paradox is this idea that you know if there are so many suns and so many planets and the universe is so big and also the universe is so old you know if you then if you then sort of look at it statistically the fact that on this earth we have there there's life there's intelligent life if we consider ourselves intelligent um and we've only been around for what is it like a hundred thousand years or something the agrarian revolution was what nine thousand years ago i'm not not entirely sure 
then there might be there should be civilization out there statistically that are like a million years old and that have developed all sorts of technology to be able to come to you know to travel everywhere and it must be all over the place like statistically so then the question is okay if that's the case then why are we not seeing any aliens whereas where is it where is everybody that's the fermi paradox and then the, the the potential answer to the fermi paradox is called um the big the great filter you've heard of that no what's the great so, filter? so so the great filter is a theory that the reason we're not seeing aliens everywhere is because somewhere on the on the evolutionary timeline towards being able to travel everywhere there's a great filter where you go extinct so the great filter might actually be behind us so the great filter might be you know the the first uh the first spark of life that that's just something that's incredibly improbable it never happens but for some reason it happened here one in a quadrillion chance that that something that wasn't life can come to life the other great filter might be like from single cellular life to multicellular that that never happens but somehow something very improbable here happens or maybe it could be the step towards intelligent life or some some great filter or maybe the great filter is ahead of us so maybe once a civilization figures out weaponry that's powerful enough to blow themselves up they eventually do or maybe some other great filter is ahead of us so maybe the reason we're not so maybe life pops up over everywhere across the universe and then it blows itself up all the time and they never meet because they've blown each other up before they can meet so maybe that's what's going on maybe there are aliens but they're just blowing each other up all the, uh, did themselves up and we're gonna blow it, uh, ourselves up you know in the, somewhere in the next hundred years or something so I guess the real question then is, do you think Bitcoin is not only the best currency on planet Earth, but on the universe? Maybe, maybe. Well, it wouldn't, it wouldn't work across the universe. So it would, we probably need something that would work, you know, intergalactically, uh, interplanetary at least. Because, because right now mining needs to be somewhat Centralized. In, in, the, in the neighborhood of each other because otherwise mm. blocks take too long to travel to another unless we find out some sort of faster communication technique maybe then mm -mm -mm. it could work but in that case maybe we can also think of better solutions than having blocks in the first place just have instant transactions somehow or so there's probably room for improvements um but um it's, it's a, it seems to be the best money we have discovered in the universe so far the world, uh, yeah, sounds good. Uh, so, any any final uh, comments, thoughts where people can learn more about you? It's bitcoinmagazine.com, obviously. But what about yourself on Twitter and if people want to follow you there? Yeah, I'm uh, Aaron Van W. So that's you know double A, Aaron Van W. Uh, podcast is the Fan Weirdom Schurznado. You can find that in your podcast app, or if you speak Dutch, there's the Bitcoin Show. Um, I hope to have a book in the next uh, the 2021. I, I hope to be able to publish a book, but I'm working on it. It's Dude, on the pre, do it's it. On the pre <laughs> do I'm pretty, it. I'm pretty far, but I'm not happy with it yet. But um, oh, yeah, I, you don't I, have an, I, You're not going to share the name, obviously, yet. Or do you have a name for it? Pro I probably shouldn't do that in in uh, because yeah, yeah, I'm yeah. going to get someone to uh, someone's going to take it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Or or at least. I haven't even registered. Well, I'm excited. I'm excited. Or anything. Is it going to be super geeky or like more storytelling ish, or a little bit of both? Uh, I guess a bit of both. Hopefully, that's the idea. Yeah. Hmm. I'm like, I'm pumped, man. I'm pumped. Okay, cool. Aaron, thanks for uh, you know spending this time with me, man. Really appreciate it. Uh, thanks for I guess inspiring me to some extent to doing whatever the heck this is. Uh, and uh, yeah. I don't know. That's that's all I got. Thanks for having me, man. Cool. I'm gonna kill it. Good luck with the podcast. Thank you.